I am pianist Leif Ove Ansnes, and this is Living the Classical Life. The familiar Führerlisse, performed here on a period instrument of Beethoven's day by Leif Ove Ansnes at the Rosendahl Chamber Music Festival, which he founded. Today, Living the Classical Life travels here to Norway in an adventure funded in part by you, our viewers, as we immerse ourselves in the powerful yet austere beauty of Rosendahl a 17th century coastal village stunning in its beauty, forged by glaciers and carved with fjords between jagged mountains, wild waterfalls, and ubiquitous streams that flow as a constant baseline for a life surrounded by nature. The surrounding buildings of the estate are teeming with music and rehearsals of friends and distinguished musical personalities, bringing to life this small agricultural and shipbuilding community with the power of Beethoven. I had the pleasure of catching Leif Ove in a rare free moment to discuss his musical life and his pathway to seek his most authentic voice. Thank you so much for being on the show. Welcome to Living the Classical Life, and I thank you for welcoming me here to Rosendahl in Norway, thank your, you. your home country. Pleasure to have you here. How did you choose Rosendahl as the setting for this, this beautiful festival? Well, I've played here since 92 was the first time, and actually I've played mostly in this room where, where we are right now, this in, room. This, in this manor house, in the Red Room. The, um, they have some historical instruments here, and in this in this room there's a beautiful play L from 1860, uh, and I've played many concerts on that. It's such a small room, you know, it can seat um, 70 people. Um, and I would normally come here in the summer and, and try out something, try out new solo repertoire or some chamber music, bring some friends, uh, and play two, sometimes three concerts with the, with the same program, because there was little audience capacity yeah. and uh, and had such a great time and and also enjoying this this historical instrument and of course the place the the nature the english garden the the house i mean this is unique in norway we have so little of of these kind of small um manor houses and aristocracy mm -hmm. um so uh, and i've loved how this place has been run over the years and then New opportunities um, arose when, when they made this wonderful new concert hall in uh, about 2015 and we started the, the Chamber Music Festival in 16. Mm -hmm. So you've had a lot of involvement with music festivals in, in general. Is there something particularly special about that setting? You mentioned that, you know, of course, the beginning of this, this particular room. That's an intimate setting. Do you, th do you think that maybe audiences feel a little bit more... Um, their, their participation is, is a little bit different, it's a little bit more intimate. I think it's 
very important for all, all of us to get back to that environment um, regularly. I mean, so much of the music we are playing are, is written for these kind of rooms. I mean, this kind of intimacy. Um, it was meant to, you know, we were playing Beethoven chamber music this this week. It was meant for a few friends to come together and enjoy this wonderful music. It wasn't meant for huge concert halls. It's also wonderful to play it in, in huge concert halls. And this music is so potent and it, it can, it can certainly, you know, project in, in the great halls that we have today. But it's also wonderful to get so close to the music, to to hear when the bow, you know, is is touching the string and 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 this very tactile feeling of that, to, you know, to 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 see the musicians sweating, to <laughs> to to hear them breathe. I mean, the whole um, uh, the whole intimacy is so important for so much of this music, I think. And that's what one gets in some of these festivals. And, and I think we get it in the new hall. We get it certainly in this room, in the church we're using. Um, and also, I think it's important to talk with people about the music. So I, I, we try to have not only lectures, but also talk before the concert and, and show our passion for this music and what's it, uh, open up, hopefully, for 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 people who are not so used to classical music coming to listen to Beethoven for the first time. Where are these audiences coming from? Well, so, so, there are so many places like Rosendahl, well, not like Rosendahl in Norway, <laughs> but in, in the way that they are remote towns. Yeah. Uh, like you say, we're, we're spread over you know, quite a long country um, uh, geographically. Um, and we are a re remote country, you know, we are in, in the north. Uh, the audiences for the festival are though coming, I mean, the, the real music lovers from all over the country coming here. Um, they buy a festival pass. Many of them go to everything. There might be four concerts in a day, plus a lecture, plus a, you know a exhibition or whatever. Um, and then we have um, people coming from Bergen, which is a two-hour boat ride for coming for the day. Uh, then we have some local people coming. We have also had uh, apparently uh, this year visitors from Hawaii and uh, and the United States and uh, and from different European countries and it's picking up again after the pandemic we found that before the pandemic we had more and more international visitors so it's exciting i've been really curious to ask about the pacing of our musical lives i've, I've been following your your recordings and performances since the 90s and i i had some awareness that you've really had a pretty big pace of, of life. So if we're talking about specifically music, summer music festivals, wouldn't the summer be the time that you would otherwise take to have some rest, to develop some repertoire? I mean, in between your busy season, how, how does this all fit into the big picture? Well, I, I do actually. Normally this festival is in August. This year it's, it's in July and it's because of my schedule, because I'm doing some projects with the Mahler Chamber Orchestra in August. We're playing at the Proms in London and, I've, and, and uh, a tour, and I've known that for a long time. So I asked the festival, could we, could we um, um, move it one month? But usually I take July mostly off. I have three children, and they are off from school. My wife is also off from, from work that, that month. Um, so. That seems to be a, a really good time to... Actually, I really also prefer if I can not play for 10 days, maybe, mm -hmm. not, not touch the piano, and then come back and, as you say, also study new things or, or things that I have to prepare for the new season. And, and I will take some time off. It's, it's a little more sketchy this, uh, this summer, but I need to um, get back to studying Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto that I'm playing in September, and I haven't played for over 10 years. So um, that's a big work to, to, to take back. And I have my Mozart project, as I mentioned, to, at, the, at the proms coming up in, in August. Uh, so there won't be much real holiday, but you know, I will be in one place. I'm actually going to north of Norway. We have a summer house uh, just above the Arctic Circle. Um, uh, really, really north. Uh, Though for Norwegians, it's not really north because we, you know, you could go much further. Is, is that meaning to say that we would get more daylight there uh, than we get here, even in Rosendahl? I mean, at midnight, it's still pretty bright here. 
where we have the summer house, you wouldn't have, uh, you, you, don't, you don't have darkness in the night. Um, so, you know, you, you go outside two o'clock in the, in the night and it's, it's bright. I mean, if the sun is, if it's sunny, it's, it's really, it's sunny, like in daylight. Um, so um, we have to cover the windows to be, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to be able to sleep. Um, but it gives a lot of energy. I, I love it, actually. I wanted to explore a little bit more that idea of, you mentioned the Rachmaninoff Third, which I've heard you play in Cleveland. I used your recording as a reference point uh, when I was growing up. And, okay, maybe, maybe not necessarily Rachmaninoff Third, but any piece that you've played in your life and you've had some time to step away from it, is there a certain value uh, by not doing it for a while that you might notice some growth in yourself or your approach to the music? Oh, I think certainly uh, pieces feel different coming back to them after a long, after a long time. Um, and it's so interesting always how the brain works because pe pieces that I've been playing a lot, I can still come back. I mean, if it's been eight or ten years um, um, of not touching the piece, I sit down and I look through the first pages and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I... I'm, I'm starting from scratch here. I, the, the fingers can't find it. And it's like a read through. And then the second time I start again, it's like the, the brain has picked up a file mm. uh, and it remembers. So it's, it, there's a jump. Suddenly I can play it. Uh, it's so, I, I find it so fascinating how the brain works in that way. It just has to be reminded once about where are, where, where are these chords? Where are these passages? And and then it it comes back, but of course it's a lot of work. I mean, with a piece like like Rock Mine of Three, so and in a way, um, the process has to start from scratch. You have to you have to try to start, uh, not knowing it, you know, because that's the way it's it can be fresh again. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's terribly important. Um, so it's, it means it's also important to step away from these pieces uh, regularly. I'm not somebody who, who keeps, keeps playing the Beethoven concertos uh, every month just to keep them uh, you know, in, my, in, my, in my repertoire. No, I, I, can, I can leave a piece for 10 years and then come back to it. As, as you're looking at how you're growing with certain repertoire, one of my favorite uh, talks about the subject of creativity is not from a musician, but uh, John Cleese is, is an actor. And he talked about how people who are creative need to allow themselves a certain amount of time to kind of think about nothing, where the, the subconscious just has time to have ideas occur to them. What I'm wondering is with your very busy concertizing schedule and you, between the focus of concerts and travel days, do you have the time and space to let these subconscious ideas come to you? Well, I try to. I mean, I, I live in, I'm balancing my, my touring life and musical life with family life. And that, of course, gives a very different aspects to the life. I'm also, uh, if we still talk about summer holiday, for instance, I, I find that the nature is really important for me. Um, in the summer, I really prefer to spend time in Norway, in this environment, and, and uh, there is something about, I mean, the light, the, the, the power of, of the nature. Uh, I love to, to experience the seasons here and the, the real difference between, I mean, actually in north of Norway where we have the, the, the summer house, in the summer you can have, it can be sometimes wintry and really, really cold, and then suddenly it's tropical, and you know it's it's very wild. Also, you know, you never know what kind of weather you have. Um, why am I talking about that? Because the nature is bringing me to uh, to to let all these all these subconscious things work. But it's never silent. I mean, I I find that when I'm in the nature, when I walk in the mountains, when I when I'm there and I just hear birds and it's, it's extremely silent there, you just hear the nature. Um, still in my brain, in, inside, there's always music. Uh, it's, it's strange how that, when, there is, when I'm in the nature, there's even more music sometimes. Just things popping up, things that I 
I have heard maybe things that I have to work on, but 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 more just random things that I love, and you know, Beethoven is often <laughs> often turning up. How do you find a sense of peace as you navigate all the travel, all the deadlines that you have to face? and then find enough sense of peace, if that's what you're looking for, on stage, that you can communicate your best performances? Well, I'm not sure I'm, I'm as, as peaceful as I, I pretend to be always, certainly not in this festival where there's so much going on and, and I'm not only playing, but I'm, I'm, I'm a host and I'm speaking. And there, it's, it's, um, uh, I can be quite stressed and wake up early in the morning and think what, what's going on today and I have to make a very detailed plan of every every minute. Um, I don't know, it's about trying to find the balance and, and for me just concentrating on the important things and uh, on the music and on my family and uh, um, I've tried to, to I, it, one, was, one has to try to find a balance in life. I mean, I when we got our first daughter I was 40 and I decided less concerts now. I, I had been traveling um, 220, 30, 40 days a year for a long time. That's I was crazy. doing about 110 concerts probably for 15 years, 10, 15 years. It was, I didn't really have much feeling of a home. Mm -hmm. um, I lived two places. I lived in Copenhagen. I lived in Bergen, Norway. Um, and I did, I had a deep feeling of, you know, I, I, I need to come down a little bit in amount of concerts. So since then I have played around 70 concerts a year. It's still a lot of traveling, yes. maybe about half the year. Um, but I do have a feeling of home, of, of course, because of, of the family uh, also. And, and I'm trying to find a balance. It's not easy. Sometimes in the, in the spring and the autumn when I travel a lot, it just feels like I'm not enough at home. And sometimes then, you know, it can be in the summer, I feel I'm not, or in the, you know, when I'm a lot at home, I don't feel I'm working enough on the music. So it's, uh, you just have to try your best, really. How about feeling at home on stage? Was performing always natural to you? I've, I've always loved playing for people, um, but I wanted them to take it seriously. You know, I, I played, I remember some family gatherings when I was little, um, and I was asked to, to play, I was eight, nine years old. And if suddenly um, some of my relatives, some, some children started dancing around while I played or so, I would stop, I would get really angry and, and, and get out of there <laughs> because I wanted them to listen, you know? I, 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 for me, it was really serious from very early on. Um, I had no idea that I was going to be a pianist. You know, I was not surrounded by professional musicians. My parents are music teachers, and I'm from a I'm from an island on the west coast of Norway, Kalmé. And um, in fact, I was the first professional musician in the area that I, that I met was when I was 13, 14, and I, he became my teacher. Um, but it was still very, very serious for me. When I sat down at the piano, I felt, you know, this is this is my my language, and I want people to listen. Uh, so I played in many, you know, small local gatherings from the age of eight, nine, um, and I always enjoyed it somehow. Um, and then, by the age of fourteen or so, I started thinking. It seems like people do listen when I play. Then maybe I have something to to tell, and and that was inspiring to me. And then I I thought, okay, maybe I can be a pianist. One of the questions I always have for myself is regarding stage psychology, finding the zone, finding flow state. Was this something that got easier for you as you went along? Maybe yep. I'll, maybe I'll put it this way: <clears throat> if there are days where you're more tired or you find it harder to concentrate, do you put your focus of attention in a certain area that helps you get to that flow state a little bit easier? Well, it's, it's you know, you can never feel free on stage if you're not really prepared. And 
I was almost over cautious in the beginning of my career in, ter in, in, in terms of, of um, the amount of pieces I was playing. And I, I, I played a few concertos the first years. I played Prokofiev III, I played uh, Liszt No. 2, Mozart D minor and the Greek and that was about it. And I'm basically with many orchestras I made my debut with, with the Greek concerto, which was you know, perfect for a Norwegian young pianist to play. The big Norwegian piece um, uh, composed by a 25-year-old uh, composer who wanted to, to 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 conquer the world, and it's, it's a part of the piece in a way. This this young enthusiasm, um, and I remember, huh, I remember I played in, in the Ho Hollywood Bowl with the uh, LA Philharmonic. I was 21, and I knew already that the year after I. I I was 21 or 22. Mm -hmm. um, the year after, I had agreed to play Rachmaninoff three on the same stage, but I hadn't yet um, played it publicly. Uh, but the, the date was in my calendar. And, and I remember sitting in Hollywood Bowl playing the Greek and thinking, I'm never going to be able to do Rachmaninoff three here, yeah. because this is a lot of pressure I'm playing for 12,000 people. Uh, you know, and uh, it just felt like a big event. Um, but I did the next the next year, of course, because you, you you at that time I found it very difficult to trust that I could actually be able to play a new concerto in in half a year. Or I would sometimes cancel um, cancel a concerto performance, um, which which was for five months down the line because I I got panicky and I thought I can't I can't learn it in time. Mm -hmm. So I was very restrictive, and I, I was offering the organizers one recital program or one and a half. You know, I was I was keeping to that, and then I was I got to be twenty six, twenty seven, and I thought, oh, maybe I should experiment a little bit more, play more chamber music, a bit more of this and that, and 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 then I found that I had more capacity than I thought, um, and I'm quite su surprised to see how many pieces I've been playing and recorded and everything. But I was, I was thinking of myself as a slow learner. I was going to ask, I mean, do you consider yourself to be a fast learner? I, I assumed that probably with this enormous amount of repertoire that you've both recorded and performed, with all those travel days, you probably had to learn these texts very quickly. No, I have never considered myself a fast learner, um, and I will never be one. Mm. Uh, I've always needed time. I mean, coming back to Rachmaninoff of Three again, uh, that's the piece I... I remember, you know, studying it for one and a half year before I played it, it publicly. Um, not every day because I was doing other concerts and so on, but but really regularly for for a long, long time. And with a big concerto, with a big sonata, I, I I need months. I would never do a piece in. You know, I've I've never been a pianist. That, if, 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 you could call up and say, could you do Chopin's second concerto in two months? No, no way. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I would need much more time for that. What about that relationship that you have to the pressure you mentioned? Hollywood Bowl in your early 20s, that, I, I would assume that takes a certain amount of confidence inherently that you already had. Were you a confident person in general growing up that you think, okay, that's, that is of course a little bit of pressure I have to deliver on that, that occasion, but uh, yeah, I think I can do it. I was not confident at all as a person. I was very insecure about so many things, but I was confident enough when I played certain pieces. I, I had um, a very convincing teacher who I met when I was 15 years old, the Czech Yiji Linka, who moved to Norway in, this, in the early 70s, very passionate, um, Slavonic, fiery temperament was very important for me because I was a rather shy boy from the you know rural area of Norway, and and there was suddenly I met this person who, um, you know, music was life and death. It was real, real passion, and you could tell stories, you know, that were, with the music which were so dramatic, and and it, uh, he opened up so many doors for me, and. I felt when I'd worked on pieces with him, and I, I came out of those lessons, and I, the, the first thing I wanted to do was to go and practice. <laughs> and, and, and really, when I'd worked on these pieces, like I worked uh, on the Greek concerto, um, with him discovering the piece from inside, I didn't know the Greek concerto really before I studied it with him. I, I, I'd heard the beginning, uh, <laughs> but I didn't really know the, the piece. But 
then I felt, you know, with, with weeks and months and working together with him and discovering these pieces, yeah, I, I know this piece now and I'm confident enough to play that. So I had these uh, areas of confidence, but in a, you know, I was so I, I fragile and insecure about so many other, other things. So in general, I found those years the beginning of my career very difficult you know to travel alone and to get to know so many things but but when i went on stage with those pieces that i knew i was quite confident mm -hmm. did that get easier with time yeah the all the other things you know i i think that i um I stopped normal school when I was 15 and started at the Bergen Music Conservatory and there was only music for me and because the teacher that I, Eugene Linka, had, had told me, you know, you need to start now, those years are really important from your 15 to your 20, that's when you, when you really, yeah. really can learn most and, and I think he was right, They're incredibly um, important years. Um, and I've never worked as much as those those years, you know, many hours a day, getting up early in the morning, just studying. Um, and um, but as a person, I wasn't, I didn't have the same development. I think there were things that I was missing from mm -hmm. that maybe other young people have more of, you know, social life and because I found suddenly I had this responsibility to defend a position that I was a pianist. I made my debut when I was 17 with recitals in Norway and suddenly I was touring, you know, 18, 19 year old. I was playing with the Oslo Philharmonic at the Edinburgh Festival of the Maris Janssons and things started to happen um, internationally for me. Um, and um, I just wasn't there as a person. I wasn't ready for that. But as a pianist, I was sort of ready for it. You mentioned one of my favorite musicians, Marius Janssons. What was he like as a man? What was it like to collaborate with him? I heard just one concert from him in the the Concertgebouw in Amsterdam, and it was, I remember, the second half was Brahms' first symphony, and I've never heard magic like that. And I'm, mm. I'm just so um, happy for you that you had chances to work with him. Yeah. Well, he had he had so many many aspects to him. Um, he changed also over the years. You know, the years where he was in Oslo, um, it was so exciting to be part of that. By the way, because he was he he sort of brought the whole Norwegian music life up to you know to realize that we we can do it. You know, that orchestra was was okay, was good before, and then he. But he did something to it, which which brought them up on such a level, and they were, you know, they were highlights suddenly at the Salzburg Festival and the Edinburgh Festival, and and I, I then I was suddenly the soloist with them, and I was part of that um, uh, happening, which was so exciting, um, and to see what success they had, and and he achieved that, of course, by enormous dedication. I mean, I, there's just no, no conductor that have worked so tirelessly, just controlling everything about, you know, uh, and, and it could be too much, you know, it could be, and as, he, as a, I'm not sure he, he loved to accompany at that time, mm -hmm. because he was not so much in, in control of it then. Um, so he wasn't always the most flexible accompanist. With the years, he became much more freer with that. And when we, you heard him at Konchatkova, probably he was quite a different conductor. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but my goodness, what what fire there was in in some of those. I, I sometimes go and online and see some some of those performances from um, the Oslo Philharmonic. There's especially uh, um, Weber Oberon Overture. I think it's from Japan or something, and you know you can see it on YouTube. Uh, my goodness, from the from the nineties, that dedication, that fire, which was in that orchestra. I, I don't know a better performance of the piece, to be honest. I wanted to just briefly touch on, just to get a sense of your musical world, some of your pianistic influences. You've mentioned Dino Lepati, Sviatoslav Richter, Michelangeli, and the Hungarian Geza Anda particularly underrated pianist, I think. Hmm. Maybe we can just briefly touch on each. <clears throat> what drew you to... Well, let's start with Dino Lipati. 
Well, can we go the other way? Because for me, my development was so that I was very influenced by my Czech teacher about the sort of Russian... I mean, he had played for Richter and Gilels, and, you know, so he was, he was very influenced by, by those Russian pianists, and he was very much emphasizing the, the, the Eastern European and Russian school of piano playing and believing very much in that. So I also believed in that then. Uh, and for me, Richter became a, a kind of, I don't know, it became almost a religion at some point. I was, I was so obsessed with him, I felt everything he was doing was right. It's strange to think about now, because now I'm looking at, at Richter sometimes like an odd bird and thinking that it's very foreign from how I think about Schubert or Mozart, or, or and then other times, of course, it's absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. what he did. Um, um, but I was obsessed with him. And then, I, I, I don't know what it was, but I think it was also the sort of... It wasn't the pianistic, fiery... I mean, it was more about... It was always the music. It was the sort of symphonic sound that he had. Um, a kind of darkness. I was, I was drawn to the, you know, the slow tempi that he could... Uh, um, make and the and the contrasts in the music you know from the very fiery to to the stillness that was there often as well um with the years i started discovering that there's also a lot of charm in music and uh, <laughs> I, I had problems with that in the beginning i didn't see that there was a lot of humor or charm or you know i was a very serious young man uh and and for instance somebody like horowitz i i I didn't get at all in the beginning. I didn't get that pianistic f firework. I didn't understand it. Of course, I didn't hear it in the hall. So, I, I mean, it must have been amazing in the hall. But I just thought it was exaggerated and, and uh, sounding awful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then with the years, of course, you know, you see qualities that are so enormous. Um, and Lipati and um, somebody like Michelangeli and the, the, the sounds and the colors and all these that sort of things. I, I started discovering dif different aspects of, of uh, yeah, pianistic qualities. I mean, Lipati was, I mean, so, so complete, uh, but we didn't get to have him for very long. I mean, uh, to imagine how he could have developed as well. But listening to something like the Chopin waltzes and thinking about when he when he recorded them, what, how were pl people playing at that time, you know, and, and the understanding of the text and uh, um, the ability, I mean, the pianistic ability uh, and how natural it sounds and, and still so spontaneous and um, the complete pianist for me, you know, anyway. And how about Geza Anda? I was so happy to hear this name come up because I've mm -hmm. I collected his recordings. Uh, you know the Bartok concertos are fantastic. And how how did he come into your awareness? Um, I had um, a a wonderful wonderful mentor for many years who recently died, Jacques de Thiers, who who was was a very special man, Belgian. Uh, piano teacher uh, studied with Leon Fleischer was very close to to to, to Fleischer, very close friend, um, and um, who I met in '94. And after a couple of years, I realized how much he knew. But he just started coming to my concerts, and he liked me. And and then I realized how much he knew. And he became my teacher. You know, he sort of became my second teacher after after I had left the conservatory in Bergen. Um, um, and I think about him every day when I sit down at the at the keyboard. And he gave me all these influences as well. And he, I remember, he was the one that told me about Anda. You should really listen to Anda. This is a remarkable musician, and what he does spontaneously and with to, with different touches in Mozart concertos and this. Kind of. So I, I started listening, and, and and certainly I, I find it very thrilling. Uh, to hear, for instance, him play the Barto Concerto with his friend uh, Fritschai, oh, yeah. it's like um, mm, it's so playful. It's like a, how I imagine Barto was dreaming this music. It's not only this percussive verticality that one so often hears in these pieces and what it becomes because the difficulties are so enormous, 
but um, but it sings and it dances and it, it it's like language and uh, I love it. And Mozart concertos, I mean, he was basically the first one to lead it from the lead them from the keyboard, like like I'm 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 often doing. Um, and maybe the orchestra from in those recordings sound a little bit old-fashioned, a little bit a um, little bit heavy. But his piano playing is so full of life. I find um, um, rhetoric equalities, uh, the the different touch, different sounds. Uh, yeah, great, great musician. Do you feel like finding greater depth in music? Is that a conscious process, or is that something that happens anyway? I do find that I'm listening to different things now than I did earlier. Um, you know, uh, I want to, you know, just take a, a piece by Beethoven. I want often to hear the inner voices, to other aspects of the piece. You know, when I was in my 20s, maybe I was drawn to the obvious things, to the revolutionary character of this, the, the, the music, to the melodies, to to harmonies and so on. And then with the S, you, you, you discover, oh, there's this motor inside and the, this is what drives the music. Uh, it's more about the kind of orchestration and how to, how to build the, yeah, the tension and the storytelling in it. Um, I, somebody said that, you know, with the years, musicians play often a little bit slower and one thinks it's because they get older and they can't play that fast anymore. <laughs> yeah. But it's not true. It's because you listen differently, because you want to hear several aspects in the music. Uh, and it, then it often needs more time. And I think that's very wise. Um, a young person is not doing, maybe doing that, that in, in the same way, is not aware of how different aspects of the music need time to develop. Um, doesn't mean that one plays necessarily better, but in a different way, and that's how it should be. So this show is about life in music. What would happen if your children said, I want to be a musician, as that's my life? What, what would you think? Would you, would you be happy or would you be horrified? Well, I used to think that, oh, that would be horrible uh, because, you know, don't, uh, uh, you know, uh, do something else uh, because music fills my life so much, then, then they should find a, a completely other way in life. But I mean, it's so wonderful. I love music so much. Why, why wouldn't I want my children also to love it? So if they decide to become musicians, of course I'm I'm happy for them. I mean that that means that they 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 must love it like I I do, and that's that would be a dream if they do. Um, on the other hand, you know I'm very happy if they do something completely different in life, but still love music. Uh, so uh, I in, leave it to them. <laughs> did we in fact hear your son playing for Elisa on that special uh, period piece oh, yes. instrument? <laughs> Um, yeah, it was very funny. He, he has, he's playing a little bit the piano and, and, and he has been playing parts of the Fury Lisa. Um, <laughs> and he has been, uh, we've been talking a lot about the fact that I was going to play his piece in, in this festival. Um, so that was a funny moment that when he got to try the, the, the piano. And just to conclude the conversation, I noticed in this festival, the audience was listening in an amazingly special way, if I can call it that. It really seemed like they were listening as though this were their religious duty to take in the music. Hmm. For you as a performer in this setting, and not that we need an external reason to do music, was there ever any moment that you heard from an audience member that they responded to the music in a way that you said, this is why I do music. Oh yeah, there are many touching responses from the audience, but um, I don't know, there's something about just coming to this place, um, remote, the silence of it, and, and but more than that, the, the, the fact that, you know, we come for a few days and 
it, music is the focus here and we have some nice meals and we, we take maybe walks in the nature and um, but we are, we are, we're so looking forward to these concerts and um, we never know what will happen will the you know the meetings of these musicians happen very quickly two days of rehearsals uh, some people have never played together before you, d you don't know it might not work some performances are okay and then you have these highlights and you feel immediately that the audience gets it you know oh something is happening now that's what I love about these festivals um, when that happens it's there's a spontaneity to it, um, which is very difficult to achieve uh, in other settings, I find. And I love the friendship. I love that, you know, you play one piece as part of a program and then you go out and you listen to the others play another Beethoven piece or another or a contemporary piece or something interesting. And, and, um, and it brings us so close to each other. Sometimes we feel we really know each other very well without having talked about our lives at all with each other over dinner, but simply because we play together, we listen to the same great music. Leifova, thank you so much for being here. It's been such a pleasure to speak with you, and thanks for everything that you do in the world of music to bring us this magic. Thank you so much.